welcome to our celebration for this year's DSSG X UK. So today we're here to celebrate, um, well, the nine brilliant minds of this year's DSSG, DSSG X UK pro program and our product track partners. Um, and I'm gonna introduce you to this year's MC, Carmina Paula. Hello everybody. Um, today we have prepared a series of small talks uh, from people who are funded the program or friends of the program um, or, and uh, who run the program. Uh, but then more importantly, we would have the talks by our, done by our fellows, uh, which will present their incredible work in the last three months. Um, they've been, uh, you know, blood, sweat and tears, but also a lot of fun. And we want to present that to you. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the first speaker, which is none other of Sebastian Vollmer, uh, the director of the Turing Data Study Groups and the ELT program team lead uh, at the Allen Turing Institute and also associate professor of mathematics and statistics at the University of Warwick. So thank you, Sebastian. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Welcome to the final presentations of the Data Science for Social Good Summer Project. It is really great to see so many of you have joined to see what we have achieved over the last 12 weeks. It has been hard work, but also a lot of fun. When I first saw the great program in the US, what stuck with me is how well thought through the program is that it needed to be brought to the UK. The UK has a history of a strong NGO sector, as well as close links between the scientific community and the government. So I thought who better to champion this than our National Institute for Data Science and AI, the Alan Turing Institute and the University of Warwick, one of Turing's founding members and the university with the motto, excellence with purpose. This program is about having a positive impact by combining teaching and delivery of data science solutions. You may ask, why is it needed? Isn't the academic community already doing this? Ac academia is great at producing ideas and papers but data suggests that only a small fractions actually are actually deployed in the end. I'm giving an example here of application of data science to the health sector. But similar trends apply elsewhere. We have a growing body of papers and ideas. A quick search on Google Scholar suggests there are about 20,000 papers published in this area, but only about 153 methods have been trialed in, in, in practice according to clinicaltrials.org. So deploying data science solution affecting people directly is rare and difficult. So what's the solution? As always, as the solution for everything, it's education. This is why the, main three, the three main goals of the DSG programs are first and foremost, to train a highly talented group of data science summer fellows to tackle real world data problems, giving them the necessary practical skills and the opportunity to hone these important skills. The second is to educate the partners that the program is working with by helping them adopt the data-driven decision-making and data product, products within the organization. In doing, in doing so, we are creating a community of like-minded individuals with the great skills who like to use these, those skills to do something good in the world. Participants are recruited from a highly talented pool of students and recent graduates and are encouraged to work across disciplines to achieve benefits for the project partners, but more importantly, the people affected by their work. All of this, this is done in an open, ethical and collaborative way, resulting in an open source repository that is intended to be used by other organizations not just the partner we have been working with. So today you will see our participants present the great work they did over the last 12 weeks. During that time, they have received a tailored training in data science with the focus on bridging the gap between an excellent academic base and the skills required to develop data products. They've closely worked with their project partners and have been supported by the technical mentors and project managers. In addition, there were in-depth ethics discussions with world-leading experts on topics relevant to the projects. A lot has happened behind the scenes. So what have you missed? The program is resource intensive. 
we're at the end of a, a 12 week program, but it took a lot of effort and resource to get there. Um, and this is not where the effort stopped. Before the summer started, researchers and senior data scientists from partner organizations such as Avanade were, were sourcing and scoping projects, participants, and staff. After this summer, we will continue to support our partner organization in deploying these solutions. You will hear more about the life of a project after the summer by our last year's partners, the Procurement or Authority of Paraguay, PNCP. This is what happens in an ordinary year. I don't need to tell you, but 2020 is not an ordinary year. And it has brought the best and the worst in us. We have seen solidarity, community support. People went out shopping for the elderly, clapped for, clap for their carers. We have also seen uh, greed, sanitizers and masks being stolen you know, from children's hospitals. We have seen that issues that are also important no longer get the attention they need. Poverty, starvation, refugee crisis, for instance. Um, in fact, the problems that we consider in this cause have been magnified by COVID. Ensuring quality of childcare and early childhood edu uh, education for everyone and preventing that taxpayer money is pocketed by greedy in individuals. As every sector, higher education has been financially hit hard and when faced with a decision about what to do with the program this summer, the easy road to take would have been to postpone. However, for me, um, the global pandemic and crisis make me feel that social good needs to grow. And we need to double our efforts, not give up. We translate as much of this program as possible to an online environment. This is why we are uh, still coming together today, albeit only virtually. Of course, uh, um, this would have not been possible with the amazing staff. Without the amazing staff, the organization teams, especially those at Warwick and Turing, the research teams and data scientists of partner organizations, um, but most importantly, the participants of this summer. They've been patient with us and being proactive to deliver this program online. Um, importantly, also, we, we, had, um, we had great investments by University of Warwick and Turing, but we're also grateful to our sponsors, LV and the Bridford Bridge Trust, as well as the support we've received from ONS, Quantum Black, Refinitiv and Microsoft. So you wonder what the take home message is. And we can look to our namesake, Alan Turing, who was uh, at once theatrical and practical. It's not sufficient to know what the right thing to do is and publish about it. It is about making it happen and not about I told you so. Turing faced the issues of his time. He didn't publish a paper, we can solve the enigma but he did a vital contribution as part of a team to actually cracking it. Similarly today, we have an obligation not just to publish, but also to deliver data products that improve the society measurably. In this program, we achieve this by training highly motivated individuals to be data scientists that are well-rounded, rigorous, collaborative, and problem-focused. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, our next speaker is from Warwick Business School, which is one of the founding members of the Alan Turing Institute and partner for, of the Data Science for Social Good Summer projects. Uh, he's a professor of strategy and entrepreneurship and also dean of the Warwick Business School. Please welcome Andy Lockett. Thank you, Carmine. Uh, and I apologize in advance because I'm probably uh, the only person who's not a data scientist on this call. Uh, I started my life as an economist and have uh, migrated into an ethnographer. Anything I've gone further away from data science, so I I immediately apologise. It is probably more due to my own limitations than anything else. But welcome everybody and good afternoon. And, and on behalf of the University of Warwick, a very warm welcome to this year's DSSGX Summer Programme closing ceremony. I do hope that you've enjoyed your experiences with us. The DSG the DSSG is an outstanding programme combining excellence in training with creating real world social impact. And the University of Warwick is proud to participate in this alongside the Alan Turing Institute. Data sciences have changed the world 
the way we access information, the way we solve problems, and the way we do business. For many, this has created value, value in businesses through personalized advertisement, automatic trading, or fraud detection. But the problem is that not all benefit from data science equally. For example, many nonprofit organizations who commonly try to address some of society's most challenging problems often don't have the means to invest in data science and data science projects. And this is where the DSSGX summer program can help. The University of Warwick is one of the UK's leading research universities and also, as Carmi mentioned, a founding partner of the Alan Turing Institute. The university was formed during the late 1960s when the Wilson government was focused on social mobility and the white heat of technology. It should come as no surprise then that data science is one of Warwick's strengths. At Warwick, I use the collective term we loosely, we approach data scientists from an inter interdisciplinary angle, including maths, computer science, and the business school who will all lead the DSSGX at Warwick, but also with strong support from the center, but also the university more broadly collaborates with us through statistics, engineering, and the social sciences more broadly. At the University of Warwick, we offer degrees in data sciences and data analytics. And as Dean of Warwick Business School, I am proud to say that we were one of the first business schools worldwide who understood the importance of data science in business, creating an MSc in business analytics, a course that is now copied by many other universities. So as a university, we are delighted to host the DSSGX summer programme as it fits beautifully with Warwick's expertise and ambitions in a number of ways. First of all, it matches our ambition for excellence in teaching, as it provides a unique learning experience, bringing together some of the world's best aspiring data scientists to working teams on projects that really matter. Employing a case-based training method, the program ensures that participants get to experience all the steps of a real world data science project in a practical and not just theoretical manner. It matches our ambition for excellence and impact as it delivers usable solutions for project partners and makes them available in open source so that others can benefit as well. And last but not least, it aligns with the university's vision to help transform our region, country and the world for the collective good. The Data Science for Social Good has been running in the US since 2013. Last year, the University of Warwick partnered with the Alan Turing Institute to bring the DSSG to the UK for the first time. It was a tremendous success with five teams delivering workable solutions to our non-profit project partners. Things have been a little different this year due to COVID. However, I am delighted that the team have been able to develop and run a successful DSSGX despite the pandemic. Therefore, I'd like to congratulate the team for doing so and providing a model of how the DSSG can operate in future years if this pandemic drags on. So on behalf of myself and the university, I'd like to thank you all, the project manager, the technical staff, our project partners, the supporting academics and all the stuff that worked in the background to make this program a success. So on behalf of myself and the university, a huge thank you. So I'm now looking forward to hearing from the participants today and what they've achieved through the program. But before I do so, I'd like to thank all of the participants for engaging so fully in the programme and all of their hard work to have a positive impact on the world. So on behalf of myself, the business school and the university, thank you. And I'll now hand you back to Carmine. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, next is our friend Raid Ghani, uh, the man who actually founded this programme, Data Science for Social Good. And as we like to advertise him everywhere, the chief scientist of Barack Obama in 2012. <laughs> He's the professor in the machine learning department uh, at the Carnegie Mellon University and the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy. Uh, He's the type of mentor who will make you really figure out what problem you're trying to solve. Uh, the floor is yours, Raid. Thank you, Carmine. Uh, and um, yeah, thanks for everyone to, for, for being here today. Um, it's it's kind of you know it's good for us to see the the audience, but I think it's really helpful and it's really encouraging for the fellows to kind of see people caring about this type of work and kind of reinforcing their 
their already strong belief that this is important. Um, and you know, all of us in the beginning are just filler. Like we're just filling up time and getting you ready for the actual stars of the 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 the, the show, the summer, uh, which are going to be the fellows who spend all this time um, working on 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 these projects. So so I'll keep this short. Um, there's a lot of stuff I can talk about. You know, um, but both Andy and um, um, Sebastian have, have already covered a lot of important things. I basically just want to say three things really, right? Why programs such as this one are, are so absolutely necessary, um, not just today, but they have been and they will continue to be. Why programs such as this one are so horribly difficult to run um, and why all of us and all of you and all of the people who are not here have to figure out how do we support this type of work? How do we encourage it? How do we question it you know, to, to make sure it's getting done the right way and how to be part of it in any way we can. Um, so, um, you know, when, when, when this, these programs were started, you know, we started about seven, eight years ago, the, the, the idea was, um, you know, as, as Andy was saying that a, a lot of the, 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 you know, um, advances in, in data and all the buzzwords around machine learning and AI were really driven by the need to make more money. Uh, industry needed to make money, finance needed to make money, tech needed to make money, sell ads, make us buy things we probably don't need. Um, and, and that wasn't fair. Um, that wasn't the real need for the world. The real need was fixing issues around hunger and poverty and refugee crisis and health and education and employment. Uh, but that was kind of left behind in the and um, we couldn't just say, well, if the private sector made advances, it'll just transfer over to the public sector. That doesn't really work in these types of problems because the needs are very different. If you're a private sector company, you choose your customers. You can fire any customer anytime you want if they're not profitable. Government can't do that. We have to support everyone. Um, and that means that because those needs are different, the, the tools we're trying to develop are different. The methods are, have to be different. They're, they're similar. They can borrow from some of those things, but they, they're different because the goal is not how to be more efficient, how to do this more with the same money, but how to be more equitable um, and, and how to do it in a way that's rigorous, right? We often sort of think about, well, if social good is happening, anything is better than nothing. And, and that's not fair again. Um, people's uh, lives are being affected with these types of systems and we need to make sure we're doing it in a way that's evidence-based and that's rigorous. Um, you know, unfortunately, I live in a country where science gets questioned every day these days and, and unfortunately, a lot of you do as well. Uh, and even when people are well-meaning doesn't mean that the systems we're producing are doing what we want them to do. Just because we call something fair and equitable doesn't make it fair and equitable. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of thought at stake here. And I think academia is, is especially well positioned uh, to do this type of work. Um, I'm, I'm in a university, right? I, work, I teach at Carnegie Mellon in, 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 in the US. And, and I'm doing this work in the university because I think it's our responsibility. We have to be relevant to the problems today. Yes, we need to think about how to, how to do long-term research and how to train our, our, our students, but we also have to train them in tackling the problems of today, not just the hypothetical problems um, that might come in the future. So we have to kind of balance the thinking of the long-term, which we've been doing for a long time, with the needs of, you know, how do we train our students uh, to both be effective and responsible problem solvers um, for tomorrow? And then how do we support the communities that we live in? And data science for social good programs are, are exactly designed to do that. They're designed to, to, to work with communities that need help. And at the same time, as Sebastian was saying, um, train students to be able to do that. So it's kind of this, this hybrid um, learning by doing experiential pr program that both creates people who are effective and responsible, um, but also tackles problems that are, that are so important to deal with today. Um, but as I said, these programs are really hard to run and, and they've always been hard to run, but you know, this summer, nothing was easy for anyone. Um, and just because they're necessary doesn't make them easy, right? Universities are typically not set up for making short-term practical impact, um, and, and getting, uh, finding project partners who are committed to doing something. Uh, to taking what we're producing and actually testing it out, deploying it, um, 
having people who can who can be mentors for the summer um, and 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 really train these students to 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 learn how to do it the right way. That's hard, and so I'm extremely thankful for one to Turing and Warwick to to take this on, um, and and Sebastian for pushing this through to make this happen, and and Jules for supporting and working with him throughout. Um, and Carmina and, and Diego and Michael for, for making it possible and for all the fellows for jumping in. And, and, and there were other people involved throughout who kind of, who are not there right now, Andrea, who helped um, get things set up in the beginning. Um, you know, without all of those people, this wouldn't have happened. Um, and, and, you know, I wanna just thank them because it's, it's hard work and, and it's, it's, it's not easy um, and you really have to be passionate about it. So I'm, I'm extremely, thankful and grateful for everybody involved. Um, now that we know that, you know, th these programs are really important. They need to happen for us to make evidence-based equitable impact. Um, and they're difficult. The question for all of you listening in um, is, how do you become part of it? And, and, and if you're not, why are you not part of it? Right? Um, and, you know, we, we, We've sort of been trying, so we launched this Data Science for Social Good Foundation after running this program at the University of Chicago for many years. A lot of other universities started to work with us to create versions of these programs. And we started this foundation. Um, and, and this program is one, you know, one program that, that, the, that the UK chapter is running. Um, there are lots of other local chapters. We have another chapter in Spain and Portugal that's running a conference uh, um, or next, next month. So take a look at that. Uh, we have a lot of work going on in different different cities, different countries, and so think about you know how how you want to support this type of work, whether by being part of it, you know, uh, by doing some of this work, whether um, being mentors, whether hosting other programs, whether funding these programs, um, and and there are volunteer opportunities as well. So we also, as part of the foundation, launched um, something earlier this summer called Solve for Good. So solveforgood.org. That's a volunteer platform for people who are interested in helping but don't have, can't make a full-time commitment. Um, and organizations, nonprofits, governments who have a need um, for, for, for data um, uh, volunteers. And so this, this platform connects the two um, and, and there's a bunch of projects going on um, right now there. So if you're interested in being hands-on involved or even as a mentor over there, um, would love to get you involved. Come so, so feel free to contact us. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm extremely thankful um, to everyone who to make this happen. And I'm very proud to be associated with this program. Um, and then we're almost end, at the end of the filler piece. So um, we'll soon be hearing from, you know, the, the, the fellows to tell, will tell us more about what they've been doing. So thanks a lot for being here and thanks for supporting this. And um, feel free to, you know, um, contact me if you if you want to chat about any of this um my I'm easy to find online so thank you thank you rahid uh, so in the field of data for good healthcare plays a big role uh dr indra yoshi is the director of ai for nhsx uh leading on the creation of the nhs ai lab and a founding member of one health tech which is a network which campaigns for the needs and importance of better inclusion of all background skill sets and disciplines in health technology. Welcome, Indra Yoshi. Thanks, Carmine. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, and again, I'm just, I'm just going to echo a little bit what Riyadh said. I do feel like the filler slot, um, and I know a lot of you have got some amazing things that you've done. So I'm going to be quite brief on this slot and just kind of give a little bit of um, practical applications and then a bit of a plug uh, if any of you are looking at next steps we're looking at hiring so do get in contact with us um, number one I'm just going to explain my background because um, well the technology doesn't always work and as much as we do love uh, a bit of AI it, it didn't quite work out for me so for those of you who are big fans of Harry Potter I put up a Harry Potter uh, hanky for want of a better word all of the four dormitories so please no, no judgment and I hope you all enjoy listening to each other's presentations. A little bit about what we're doing here in the UK with the NHS AI Lab. Um, I'm just going to share my screen uh, very quickly so you can have a quick look at... Um... Oh, is it going to work? Yeah, it should do. 
um, about some of our different programs and then you can have a look at what we're doing but what I just wanted to say oh it's not going to work it's going to take a long time so I'll just I'll send the link later to the team and what I want to do we set up the lab in in essence because there is a lot of technology out there and there is a lot of people wanting to build some really great both data science but also machine learning um, tools out there but how do you actually put them into healthcare and how do you know that they're going to do what they say they're going to do which is great but then how do we build the infrastructure around it and that's essentially what we're trying to do with the AI lab is to make sure that we have the infrastructure around it make sure we get the regulations right to ensure that anything that is developed is developed safe ethically and according to legislation make sure we give funding to those people who need the funding to make sure that those products go into the front line and then importantly is to build a community and to build a network around this so it's not something that's kind of set in a in a lab or in a research environment but is applicable to the real world and is actually utilized by not just clinicians but patients in the wider healthcare society so what I would say is if you'd like to listen to a bit more about what we're doing in the NHS AI lab, we've got an event coming up on the 24th of September. Do take a look um, and details are on our website as well at nhsx forward slash AI lab. Um, and again, I know some of you have done some really amazing programs and projects. And if you are interested in health, sometimes it's a bit of a dichotomy. Um, and Riyad mentioned it, you know, industry is brilliant. It's got some really great ideas, but actually doing things for government and for the wider good can sometimes be a bit tricky. And so what we've done is we've said, well, look, why don't we actually build our own team internally to do some things um, for the wider, wider use of the internal NHS. So we are building a team of both data scientists, engineers, and technical experts. So if you are interested, again, do come and find us, come and shout at us, and, um, and good luck. And, and thank you again from, from myself as well. I'm really excited. Come in, can I hand back to you? Thank you. Thank you, Indra. We're really excited as well. Uh, so next in our panel is Pablo Seitz. Uh, he's the director of National Directorate of Public Procurement of Paraguay. I get that right. Uh, which is a national entity that evaluates and monitors the entire process of public procurement. Uh, he oversees monitoring, investigated the fairness of the public procurement process in Paraguay. So the floor is yours, uh, Pablo. Thank you very much, Carmen. Uh, I would like to share a presentation with you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pablo Seitz. I'm director of the National Directorate of Public Procurement uh, from Paraguay, and I would like to share with you our experience with the SSG program and how it helped us to, in a quick start, or, or on our very own artificial intelligence initiative and how far we have gone down that row ever since the last year. Well, a little bit of background first. The NCP is the institution in charge of looking after the public procurement in Paraguay. We play a key role in the country's transparency effort and as a guardian of public financial resources. The Paraguayan government runs over 13,000 tender process yearly which is basically which basically produced twenty thousand contracts a year and an amount of four billion dollars every year, and the DNCP owns data related to those processes, and of course some of those data are structured, but most of them are not structured yet. That means PDF documents, Word documents, image, and other non-structured data. You probably heard it before, much, 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 uh, much, uh, a lot of times more than we do. Data is the new oil. So we don't have oil, so data is, is the only oil that we have here in Paraguay talking about public administration. We realized that there is a value in the data that we have accumulated over the years, and we want to leverage it to make it Paraguayan tenders as faster more efficient and more transparent process. There is a wide range of tools that we are considering for that, from simple statistic, statistical analysis, data visualizations, and of course, mach machine learning. In this time, data and transparency are 
tools to survive during COVID administration crisis. Without transparency and without uh, open data, we are not able to survive in this crisis. We're talking about uh, administration crisis during the COVID-2. Part, as part of those support, the last year we applied to the Data Science for Social Good project with our mindset into getting or fit with, with AI. Our idea was in principle simple. We want to leverage our data to be able to identify potentially problematic tender process as early as possible. That is the, the main the difference or, uh, that we want to create to uh, detect problematic tender as early as possible. The tender verification is a very important key task here in the DNCT, but it, it is still a very human intensive one. The idea that uh, we have is to automatize flagging in this process and it probably uh, helped us to be more efficient. That was the main idea that we have in our mind when we start the, the project. With a lot of help from our friends of the Alan Turing Institute and the Warwick University, we narrowed down the problem. We focused on predicting protests based on tender metadata, the buyer institution, the amount of the tender, the tender category, and some, some others, uh, important uh, data. There you can see the, the timeline uh, that uh, lead us to create what we nickname it Alan. Our technical team collaborated sharing our data and domain knowledge and after a few months of hard work we were rewarded uh, with our very own machine learning model. I don't know if we can do it but we nickname it Alan. What we have done with, with, with Alan since then, uh, after the, the DSSG 19 was over, we set our minds into integrate Alan to our current system. Today, uh, Alan's predictions are available to tender verifiers to our employees in the form of a traffic light with three possible value, of course, red, yellow, and green, which symbolize the particular tender risk to be a, uh, part of or subject of a protest or a, any kind of, of problem in the uh, procurement industry. Uh, so we can uh, assign the red label tenders to more seniors verifiers, to, uh, to verifiers which have more seniority working here with us and uh, that help us to prioritize and make better use of their experience. Verifiers are still being trained on the use and interpretations of the AI uh, tool advice. However, initial experiences are quite promising, promising. And there you can see how it looks, how Alan's integrated in the DNCP system looks uh, on the screen or uh, on, a, on a verifiers, on a verifying screen. And, and we are still, uh, we are still learning from, uh, from the results of the system, from the, from the result that shows the system, and all verifiers uh, have much better results on their work uh, avoiding uh, protest. Uh, this is not only the, this tool that we use to avoid protest, but uh, from the, since the last year, we look at decrease of 50% of protest in our system. We have other initiative uh, regarding, regarding AI and public procurement. Uh, Alan, for us, was just the beginning. We have assembled a data team with people from several areas of our institution, and we recently uh, uh, published our first version of our data policy, which set us uh, the path towards improving from the quality of our data. Our experience at the DSSG 19 was the first step. AI is being considered to improve other areas of public procurement here in Paraguay too, such as potential collusion detection, uh, history-based provider recommendations, 
and order. This has been by all means for us a success story. We are very thankful with DSSG and everyone involved for their help, the Warwick University, the Alan Turing Institution, and we hope to continue collaborating in the future. As public authority, we play a key role regarding technology. This is not to regulate it, it is not to buy it, it's not even to develop it, but to challenge technology. Thank you very much again for the possibility of this presentation and of course for all the help that we received for, for, from all of you. Thank you, Pablo. And thanks again for, to all of our speakers today. Uh, now for what I think is the most exciting part of our event, which are the project presentations uh, by our DSSG participants, uh, which may be the future success stories uh, that we present in next, uh, next year's DSSG. So the first group has worked on a project in collaboration with Offset in the last three months uh, with the aim of helping uh, nurseries and, chil and children in the UK. So without further ado, here is the project presentation of Offset team. Our early years are some of our most formative, but they're also some of our at our most vulnerable. Ensuring a high quality of care for children under five years old is really important to us and to our partners at Ofsted, the UK government agency in charge of inspecting and regulating childcare providers across the UK. Early years care is specifically for children between zero and five years old and can be in large group settings like nurseries and preschools or individual or small group settings like childminders or small playgroups. No matter the size of the provider, if a person or institution is looking after children under five years old, they need to be registered with the Ofsted Early Years Care Providers. Each of these providers gets inspected regularly by a qualified Ofsted inspector and needs to meet set requirements and criteria in specific areas, such as leadership and management, behavioural development, and of course, the safety of the children under their care. After this inspection, the provider will be given one of four grades. Inadequate, requires improvement, good or outstanding. For the purposes of our summer project, we decided to narrow the scope down to just looking at those larger providers, those nurseries and preschools, partly because they care for more children so have a higher impact and partly because they have more data and more consistent data about them. But there's nothing to say that the techniques that we've used can't be extended to also include childminders and small care providers in the future in another project. So as of 2019, there were 24.1 thousand nurseries in the UK and 6.3 thousand of those got inspected that year. All of the inspections in the UK happen in a four year cycle. That is every single nursery in the UK will be inspected at least once within each four year chunk. But four years is a long time in the life of a child so when Ofsted receives new information about a provider, they can reassess the situation and if it's a cause for concern, they can bring the inspection forward so they can check out what's going on. So the question that we and our partners at Ofsted are asking is, can we find and inspect nurseries with the most need of improvement sooner? The way that we've approached this is with a data-driven approach. Using all of the available data about a provider, such as its current status, including its size and number of staff, and historical data, like previous inspection results, complaints received from parents, and notifications provided by the nursery themselves. And we can bring all this information together and make a risk model. And this risk model tells us, according to the data, uh, how likely a given provider is to receive one of those inadequate or requires improvement grades in the next inspection. Looking at scheduling inspections for three months, that's an inspection capacity of about 1.6 thousand. We'd expect under the current system that 16% of those would be nurseries in need of improvement, in need of extra help. But under our system, we expect to double that, finding 32% of those in need of assistance, in need of improvement. This affects 250 extra nurseries, helping the lives of thousands of children. We've worked very closely with the Ofsted team, uh, talking about how our risk model will be used in the real world. And the output of our risk model, once it is passed ongoing rigorous bias and ethics checks, will be presented to a central member of the Ofsted team alongside other data about providers so that they can make recommendations of where to inspect for regional teams. 
And it's up to the regional teams if and when they act on each of these recommendations. And it's up to them to schedule their own inspections for their local area. So as you can see, our risk model is quite far removed from the final decision-making process. It's simply there as a tool for the member of the central Ofsted team to do their job a little bit more effectively. We looked into what's important to our model and what kind of data has the highest impact on its output. And the area of most impact was previous inspection information, not just the overall effectiveness grade, but also some of the subcategories that the nurseries get graded on. The next most important was notifications. These are pieces of information nurseries have to pass on to Ofsted in the case of things like accidents or changes to management within their organisation. The next most important was the number of staff at a provider. And the next most important was information about the local area, such as the local authority a nursery falls under. To conclude, the outcomes of our summer project have been, on the one hand, inspection prioritisation, helping Ofsted find those nurseries in most need of help improving as fast as possible, uh, possibly doubling the number of such nurseries we find in a given three month period. And on the other hand, providing further insights because our model is built in such a way that we can constantly monitor the kind of data that's having the highest impact. So we can see which kinds of nurseries are at most risk of falling below adequate care levels. Hopefully this will help Ofsted going forward, looking at new policy areas, possibly impacting the lives of thousands of children improving the quality of care that they receive. I've been working with a fabulous team this summer. I'm Jenny, I've been working with Hubert, Jenning, Joanna, our technical mentors, Carmen A and Diego, our project manager, Michael, and the head of the DSSGX for Turing and Warwick, Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, I'd like to give a virtual round of applause to the Offset team. You did a great job, bravi. Um, if you have any questions about the Offset project, you can please join the panel discussions, which will be just after this webinar, and we will post the links in the chat very shortly. Uh, the second group that has worked on a project, uh, has worked on a project in collaboration with the World Bank about uncovering patterns of corruption in public procurement and public officials' asset declaration. Hi, everyone. I'm Nitya, and I will be presenting on behalf of my team at DSSGX. Our project topic is uncovering patterns of corruption in public procurement. Before we get into the project, let's start with an example. Miss Linda is the mayor of a town and is looking to buy some hospital beds for a local hospital. To do this, she goes through the government's official public procurement process, where all goods and services required by the government for the benefit of its citizens are purchased through a regulated bidding process. Eventually, the contract is awarded to a small supplier overseas, say, Company X. All seems fair and square, but suddenly the contract gets dissolved and Miss Linda is arrested on grounds of corruption. What happened? Well, the anti-corruption agency discover that Miss Linda's husband is actually the owner of the supplier that won the contract. Now this is a conflict of interest. But how did they find out? They use crucial data on Ms. Linda, that is, her income and asset declarations, where she reported her and her husband's business interests since the time she entered office. This information was not exposed by the procurement process directly, so Ms. Linda wasn't worried. Little did she know that it could be captured through another source. Analyzing asset disclosures from public officials can help detect and prevent improper practices in public administration on a global scale. This aids in better regulation in procurement, leading to less corrupt practices. But how exactly do we identify avenues for better regulation in procurement, and in a scalable manner? Well, we know that corruption activities have low visibility and are hard to identify. But with the increasing availability of open data, there's a strong need to equip researchers and governments with data science techniques to uncover potential risks of corruption. These techniques will help put in place better regulations that reduce the pathways of corruption. In this project, we use data science techniques to investigate the following questions. First, 
How can we use the asset declarations of public officials to identify corruption risk in public procurement? Specifically, what kinds of information in the asset declarations are helpful in identifying risks of corruption, and particularly the connections between public officials and companies? And also, can we use data that helps us identify connections between public officials and their acquaintances, including family members, to better detect corruption risks? We partnered with the global organization, the World Bank, to answer these questions. The World Bank's Governance and Anti-Corruption Group provides immense leadership and support for increasing transparency standards and building accountable institutions across the world. Coming to the data. We use the Open Tender database to obtain public procurement data for a range of countries. Our partners and other researchers developed some corruption indicators working only with the procurement data. However, corruption risk can be measured more completely if we also look at other data sources such as the asset declarations of public officials, and in particular, their business assets and the interests they declare in companies that win public contracts. Asset declarations are not publicly available in every country, and working with this data is a new challenge. So in this project, we developed novel tools that combine both data sources and use machine learning to find new patterns of corruption. On the recommendation of the World Bank, we focused our project on a small sample of countries that had comprehensive procurement data and public income and asset declarations data. However, Corruption is a global concern, so our solution is designed to be replicable and extendable to other countries that have asset declarations and public procurement data. The goal of our project was to identify suspicious connections between high-risk tenders, companies, and public officials. So what patterns did we find? Well. There are cases where public officials have an interest in the companies that win public procurement contracts. It's important to note that in some cases, assets and interests may not be declared, so using this data will not always detect a public official's connections to business interests. High-risk tenders can also be linked to public officials with a position of responsibility for contracts, and the type and value of their declared assets and interests in, their, in these companies. We also looked at links between suspicious tenders and other kinds of relationships such as geographic location, the shared business interests of public officials in the same agency, or the party affiliation of public officials. These data links can be helpful in establishing possible relationships between the winning company and the agency awarding the tender. Our findings and tools provide the basis of several long-term impacts, which include evidence for better policy making in any country where corruption risk is a concern, useful inputs for furthering corruption research, and importantly, our approach is scalable to other countries where the data is accessible. With such an impact, the ultimate goal is to prevent corruption and make public procurement more efficient and transparent. My name is Nithya, and I had the pleasure to work in an incredible group. My teammates are Billy, Paula, Brenda, and Chi, and our amazing mentors, Carmine, Diego, Michael, and Sebastian. Thank you. Great job, World Bank team. Uh, you had a chance and you blew our minds. So another round of applause. Um, if you have any questions about the World Bank project, please join our panel discussions, which uh, will be after this webinar. Um, please look out for the links in the chat, the chat button is on the bottom. Um, last but not least, we have Sir Adrian Smith, which is the Institute Director and Chief Executive of the Alan Turing Institute. Adrian, floor is yours. Am I visible uh, to everybody? I hope so. So, <clears throat> first of all, uh, to Ryan and Sebastian and others who have put in tremendous efforts here, uh, my thanks and congratulations. And to all the participants, um, I hope you've had a wonderful experience, uh, even in these difficult times. Um, and I hope that from this, you, you've learned a lot, how to present, uh, crack problems, 
work across time zones and very importantly to work with other colleagues. Uh, as um, an institute, Turing is very much geared to the public good and of course data science for, for social good is an integral part of that. Uh, so this is an important initiative for us and so that's why I wanted to take the opportunity as director of Turing uh, to be able to thank and congratulate everybody uh, for participating in this. It's really important, um, to not just for your learning, but I think for the world in general, that we have the talent and the skills to bring to bear on actually social and public good, and to use data science and AI ethically, safely, responsibly to contribute to society. So thank you to everybody, but I should in particular thank the sponsors of this particular event, the Bridge Trust Charity, uh, LV Insurance. And of course we have in the background a lot of supporters and let me particularly mention our Office for National Statistics, Quantum Black, uh, Refinitiv, and uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, again, our university partners, University of Warwick. So thanks to everybody. I hope you've had a wonderful time and will take away um, a lot of learning and pleasure and importantly, new friends and networks. Um, involved going forward, uh, Jules, Sebastian will be able to, to keep in contact with you. We have um, an email address, data science for social good. Uh, and I hope this will remain with you as an important experience for a long time. So. Um, hello and goodbye and congratulations to everybody and thank you very much.